Hello, I'm Donald Leggett. Welcome to this edition of London Southeast CEO Interview. Our guest today is Nicholas Nelson, CEO of Sulnox Group, and they are a microcap listed on Aquis, which recently took over Next Exchange. Uh, welcome, Nicholas. Good morning, Donald. Okay, let's start by uh, asking you to give us a broad overview of Sulnox Group. Explain to us who you are. All right, well, as you said, we're a, we're a micro cap company. Um, our market cap is about 35 million pounds. Uh, which actually makes us one of the larger constituents on this Aquas exchange, which used to that's, be that's next. impressive. I didn't realize you were so big. Yeah, yeah. Um, but perhaps we'll come on to the reasons why I think our market cap is so high. But we managed successfully to raise about a million pounds as part of the float process, which started really uh, middle of 2019 when we raised about 600,000 pre IPO. Then there was some money. We're on getting this. ahead of ourselves. Right. You okay. Lux, what do you do? Okay, fine. Uh, we are a speciality chemicals company. That's our broad bracket. Uh, we specialize in fuel conditioners um, to enable uh, water to be emulsified with fuel. Um, our business model is that we are a royalty company. So we don't manufacture anything. We don't send anything out or distribute anything. We don't even collect the payment from the end customers. That's all handled by our chemical manufacturer called Nurion, which is a big Swedish uh, chemical company. And they do all the fulfillment. And but you, you're the brains. You, you, you think up the product, yes? Yeah, well, we invented the product about six years ago. Uh, so it was invented by one of our originators. Um, and he's, he was a consultant with us until we listed. Uh, we've got this formula. It's a broad formulation. And out of that formulation, you can make specific products. And the formulation is a collection of raw chemicals, raw ingredients. They're all organic and all, all sustainable. And, and the, the importance of Nurion is that they are the exclusive manufacturer of one of the ingredients, which is quite a rare ingredient. Okay, so you've um, got two products, uh, yes. as I understand it. Forgive me if I'm wrong. Yes. Uh, a heavy fuel oil emulsifier and a diesel conditioner. Correct. Is that right? Yes, that's right. So with the HFO, heavy fuel oil emulsifier, that enables us to add water to the HFO, as you know, it's really thick. It's really the dregs at the bottom of the barrel. Of viscous, the I love the word viscous. Viscous, okay, fine, I'll use that word. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and in fact, if you were to have heavy fuel oil in your mug and turn it upside down, it wouldn't flow at all. It's even thicker than, than, uh, than treacle. Um, you, we can add 18% water to that, and already now it's be able to flow more easily. It doesn't require so much heating to make it flow. And by adding water to it, you're enabling, you're basically oxy oxygenating this heavy fuel oil, which is very dense and very difficult to burn it at the best of times. Just to give you a, a little fact here, that typically with a ship, when it's burning the, the, the ordinary HFO, it's thought that 50% of the fuel actually goes out of the chimney in, in the form of exhaust. Because it's not very be helpful. That's it's not, not good if you're the owner. No, it's not, it's, it's not good it's if not you're good for the environment either. It's not good for this environment. Absolutely. When, when you when you consider, if you just another little interesting fact, I read it on the, on the Department of um, Maritime Transport or something website that the Carnival Shipping Company, which has got about a hundred cruise liners, they put out the same toxic emissions as all the cars in Europe. There are thought to be two hundred and sixty million cars in Europe. Their one hundred ships puts out the same toxic emissions. Obviously, they use a lot of fuel, but it's the quality of the fuel that they're using is so disastrous for the environment. That's absolutely fascinating, Nicholas. Okay, hold on to that factoid that you've just given me, and yeah. then relate your own emulsifier. How much difference does your emulsifier make? How much difference would it make to Carnival, for example? Um, well, we could give them a significant saving in costs in terms of fuel savings, just by, by adding Can water you put a figure fuel. on that? A percentage? Yeah, yeah. Our target... Our, our target is about 6%, 6 or 7% fuel savings. I don't um, think that's a small number. That's a very large number, I suspect. The Carnival would rip your arm off for 1%. Anybody, anybody's arm off. It's a big amount of, when you consider how much fuel these ships use, hmm. 80,000 gallons a day would not be unusual for a, for a, big, a big ship. Um, so not just is it the fuel, the economy savings as a result of adding the water, making the burn, making the, the, the explosion in the combustion chamber more effective mm -hmm. um, and therefore burning more of the fuel. Um, it, uh, it saves fuel because it reduces the amount of heating up of the HFO required as it, trans as it transfers from the main 
fuel tank to the engine, it has to be heated up to about 100 degrees centigrade. And we think that consumes in that process about 10% of the whole fuel just by heating it up. That's absolutely yeah. fascinating. Now, carrot and stick, let me turn to the new IMO rules. To what extent have those actually helped you? Uh, ships are now banned from using heavy fuel oil with a sulfur content of of, of greater than 0.5%. Now, that's an extraordinary change for the industry. Uh, how has the industry uh, coped with that? And how does that benefit you? Does it benefit you? I can speak with some authority on this because we have spoken to many ships engineers and, and ship owners uh, over the course of time just to get uh, soundings on this IMO 2020 and how they're coping. And they're really struggling with it. Well, firstly, IMO, they, 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 they just came out with this big thing. You have to reduce toxic emissions from three, or sulfurous emissions from 3.5% to 0.5%. Go away and do it. And nor, nor was there much of a time frame. It was all done very quickly. Pretty quickly. Yeah, absolutely right. Uh, they, they did give certain concessions, but it's now in place and every ship on the high seas has to be compliant. Otherwise, they get heavy fines or their ships have to be docked. And, and that's it. And I have to say that all the shipping families I've spoken to, they don't want to break the law and they're not breaking the law. They are compliant. But by being compliant, all they're doing is that they're causing other problems. There are two ways of being compliant, two accepted methods. They either fit an exhaust scrubber, which is like a great big shower unit stuck on the side of the funnel, and it washes the, the, the heavy metals and the other toxins out of the fuel and dumps them in a big holding tank on the ship. Right, now what happens to that dirty poisonous water? Generally, it gets thrown over the side although because there aren't sufficient facilities to recycle it on land. Or because scrubbers cost a lot of money, about four million pounds to get them fitted, and the ship has to be docked whilst they're being fitted, it's not that economic, um, they turn to this ultra low sulfur heavy fuel oil, which is very expensive, about twice the price of normal HFO. Um, but if you know anything about fuel, you know, you'll know that fuel needs sulfur in it to make it uh, lubricate to give it a lubricant, to give it lubricity is the word. Uh, and by removing this lubricity, the sulfur, they have to add something back, otherwise it will destroy engines. And they add these aromatics, which are different types of chemicals, but those aromatics now give rise to greater soot and smoke or particulate matter. So it's, it's, uh, an, uh, it's oh, ridiculous. Yeah. Because now a lot of these ships, many, many waters, particularly in the Arctic, have banned ships who use ultra low sulfur fuel because the soot and smoke is, is resting on the ice caps and fouling everything, and <laughs> nobody's winning. But ours is a good solution. We believe that we can overcome all the hurdles. If we look at diesel stored in tanks, water splits from the diesel and sinks to the bottom. That's my, that's my layman's uh, way of expressing it anyhow. So what benefits does your fuel conditioner bring? Okay, well, just picking up there, what you, your, your description, uh, it's, it, it is like that. It doesn't immediately sink to the bottom. Water is something called hydroscopic, sorry, fuel is hydroscopic. Uh, it actually wants to absorb the water around it uh, and as the as the temperature changes inside the fuel tank so condensation builds up on the side the water droplets enter the fuel and they remain suspended but eventually they do drop to the bottom they give rise to the diesel bug this uh, the, the bacterial growth which leads to sludge and destroys the fuel eventually um, well, so you well, want so to how, lo how long does it diesel have to be stored before it ends up getting a bit sludgy a year, two years? No, 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 much shorter than that. It, it all depends on the, on, the, on the environment as well. If you're on human conditions, uh, very quickly indeed, the, the diesel bug, bug starts to appear within days of the fuel uh, being stored. Um, really? And, and the, it's, it's a real headache, even for stored... You know, we, we know of a big, a big diesel distributor in this country, based in Southampton. Uh, uh, because we have a lot of embedded power generation, which is not used at all, the backup generators in Britain, hospitals and the Houses of Parliament, whatever, they have huge amounts of stored diesel underneath Horse Guards Parade. There's a million gallons stored there at all times. And, they, and their main job is cleaning out these fuel tanks constantly because there is no effective biocide to kill the diesel bug. Now, what, what, our, what we do, uh, our... It's the same basic, it's the same broad formulation that makes the HFO emulsifier, but it's just changed slightly. You add a few drops of that directly to the diesel and stir up the diesel. Or in the case of a, of a moving vehicle, the general agitation of the vehicle would, would, would mix it up sufficiently. And it's a tiny percentage, one part to 2,000 parts diesel. And that will then isolate the free water 
uh, in the diesel, will then, which gives no medium for the growth of the diesel bug. And now that you've actually emulsified the free water, again, you've got the combustion benefits of this, of this very small emulsion. Which is how long will those few droplets in the mixed in, how long will that last? Two years, we don't know. We've got samples on the shelf which are two years old. Uh, that, that's, the, that's why Neurion liked our product, as I, as I understand it. Um, they, they, uh, they've been looking for a, an, emulsif an emulsifier to add to their catalogue of surfactants, because they're a specialist in manufacturing surfactants under the Barrel brand. And they've been looking for an emulsion emulsifier. They liked ours very much indeed. They wanted it. They'd been looking for one for ages. What they liked about ours was that um, it is unique in that the emulsion remains stable for an extended period of time, whereas we haven't found another emulsion that remains stable for anywhere near that length of time. Who, get, who, who pays who for what in your neuron relationship? Okay, well, like I said, we're, we're a, we are a royalty company. We do very little. We've got a tiny head office. Our cash burn at head office is about 25, 30,000, and it will hardly go up beyond that. There's no need to recruit staff. We've got, a, we've got a, the board as we like it, that's that. Um, because that's what we think investors will want. They will want a company which has got low risk, low cash requirements, and just income flowing in. So the way it works is that uh, we have exclusive uh, rights to solicit for new business under the license agreement with Neurion. Um, nobody else in the world can go out and find customers for these products, only we can, but then we sort of outsource it to, to, to distributors or other sub-customers around the world. Now they would then find their end users who might be a mine or a power station or a haulage company. And they would then order the product direct from Neurion who delivers them in these big thousand litre containers. And they then pay Neurion direct and Neurion then pay us our royalty in, in the form of a license fee and an agency fee for every ton of products sold basically. And that's how it comes in. Okay, so no. I, 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 what do you need to do uh, uh, to generate revenues? Is it in terms of, of finding a clients to actually try these things out with? Yeah, well, we spoke, we spoke about the, the reluctance of uh, chief engineers or shipping companies to commit our system. It's not just, we don't just dose the, the, the HFO on board a ship. It has to be mixed with an ultrasonic mixing device. So we're working in tandem with a Midlands-based company that, that makes this uh, ultrasonic kit. It's, it costs 400,000 pounds to put in place. It's a big ask. So I mentioned that they want to see a static engine trial, right? The same with the diesel. They just want to see that last thing. I hope it's that last thing. You need to find yourself a pilot, a pilot project. Have you found yourself a pilot project? We're, we're working on that one right now. We are really working on it. And I hope that after lockdown, the news will start flowing in that direction. D diesel is going to be much easier. And that's actually why we developed this one because the, the, the barriers to entry are much lower. Uh, you're Makes not sense. talking about yeah. Uh, and it's just it, you don't you don't have to fit expensive mixing equipment, and you're not dealing with massively expensive ships who might be stranded out at sea if it goes wrong. If you just take a, a diesel powered generator, that would be a, a perfect example. It's not going anywhere. Um, it's easy to experiment on. It's easy for the owner to run it. Uh, it's not as complex as a as a as a truck, for example. What um, kind of time frame might we, we be looking at for the, the, the diesel generator test? We were literally about to do it as we went into lockdown. We had lined up three different engine manufacturers uh, to test this. And these engine manufacturers make engines for big machines throughout South Africa. So that's our first target, really, South Africa. Um, when, when lockdown comes to an end, we're hoping that that will all resume. And we are in contact regularly with these manufacturers. So we know that they're hot to trot. It's just a case of waiting for lockdown to end. Otherwise, everything's lined up. Great, that, make, that makes perfect sense. Um, what do you think your news flow will be like over the next uh, six months, Nicholas? Well, it'll be linked to those. Uh, we'll be drip feeding our shareholders in the market um, with information about how these static or th these specific engine trials are gonna go. Um, and then, God willing, we will, that will lead directly to an order. And, what, and we believe that once the first order comes in, so once the first haulage company or mining company, I'm not going to be specific, it could be any one of those because we're talking to so many companies. Um, once they have uh, taken it on, 
word will spread and then I'm hoping that others will follow. Why wouldn't they? Because if these haulage companies are doing something to clean up the environment and they're saving potentially 6% in their fuel, others will follow. All makes a lot of sense. Nicholas, it's been a, a real joy and a pleasure speaking to you today. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, I hope that life kicks on nicely once lockdown ends for you. Um, for more interviews like this one, please subscribe to the London South East YouTube channel. And my final thought, uh, thank you for watching and stay safe.